Hey guys, Mr. Davis here. So, uh, we're going to be taking a look at uh, biodiversity and ecology. So, we've already discussed um, e a little bit about biodiversity. And what I want to do now is I want to go on using that concept of biodiversity, species richness, and um, even genetic diversity. Um, and now I want to expand that into talking about how this fits in with both the theory of evolution and with um, the theory of island biogeography, okay? So we're gonna start with just this and we'll get to an introduction of, uh, of island biogeography at the end, but here's where we need to start. So first off, a refresher on the concepts of evolution. Now, you should have covered this in your biology courses, but I wanna make sure that I go over it here and make sure we lay down everything that you need to know in terms of this course. All right, so how did we get here? Well, let's start with this. The Earth is about 4.5 to 4.7 billion years old based off of uh, radioisotope dating and available data, all right? Life on Earth is about 3.7 billion years old, okay? So life has actually been around for a while, but there's a billion years there where you just have this chemical evolution going on. It's a complex um, system of, you know, the Earth pretty much you know, figuring out how to be solid as opposed to just a mass of molten metal in, uh, you know, space, how to, you know, maintain an atmosphere, have a consistent magnetosphere, those kind of things, and also the heavy bombardment period where we get hit by a lot of comets and we get a lot of water. So what we have for the first billion years is this concept of chemical evolution. And what we have shown through a number of laboratory experiments is that in what we believe to be early Earth environments based off of geologic data and sediment and rock formations from the time, so it's not just, you know, oh, we think this would, no, it, there is evidence to back it up. You had amino acids starting to form under simplistic conditions, All right? If you remember, amino acids are the building blocks of building proteins. And uh, what you have right over there, if you look at the far end, is a picture of a simplified um, setup where you can have water that is continually heated and cooled and heated and cooled while also being exposed to electrical sparks and things like that, which will cause the formation of simple organic compounds, things that normally are made inside of living organisms, but they can form under the right conditions. And then next to that, you have a picture of a hot spring at Yellowstone, where you have a variety of different colors there from different uh, extremophile bacteria, archaea, which are the oldest kind of bacteria on the planet, where they are using chemical energy to create food for themselves. They're performing chemosynthesis. So this is how we thought think that life may have gotten started in these chemically rich environments with heat and pressure and energy being supplied from the outside world. Complex life though requires complex molecules and it's thought that the first protocells, uh, that's pre-cells or basic cells, formed around a billion years after some self-assembling polymers started to form maybe inside little chemical bubbles. So what is the most important self-assembling polymer that you can think of? Well, you better guess DNA. Yeah, DNA and RNA are both self-assembling biological molecules. If you put a bunch of nucleotides in together, they'll just start knitting themselves into a chain. Um, that's literally how a process called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, works. And that's how you amplify DNA from a DNA sample to, you know, figure out whose DNA it is. Um, from this then, about 3.7 billion years ago, you have the first fossil evidence of life on Earth. And they're from these things called stromatolites. And if you look above me, all the way at the top, that is a fossilized stromatolite. So Mr. Davis, what the heck is a stromatolite? Well, stromatolites are formations that are caused by cyanobacteria, all right? And if you look over there, so to my side and up a little bit, what you see is these formations. And above me is a live one, immediately above me. Um, that is in Shark Bay, Australia. Um, over on that side is a close-up of an artist's illustration of a stromatolite. 
They are formed by cyanobacteria that deposit layers of calcium carbonate underneath them. And as they grow, they keep laying down these layers of calcium carbonate, kind of like a very primitive coral, all right? So that thing above me at the top, you can see that it's got those layers to it. Uh, looks almost like a tree ring. Well, it's the same idea. These um, cyanobacteria build a little home for themselves and they keep pushing themselves up and up and up and up to try and, you know, stay in the sunlight. Um, now it takes, you know, dozens and dozens of years for them to build up a significant rocky layer like that. But uh, those stromatolites are bacteria. They are bacteria. They're still alive. They're growing on the surface of that structure and they're depositing layers down and they are performing photosynthesis. Um, similar structures, like I said, date back to 3.7 billion years ago. So this may have been some of the first life on Earth. This is the first evidence of life on Earth that we have. If it started before then, we simply don't have a fossil record of it, but this is the oldest evidence of life that we have. It's kind of cool. All right, so from there, from you know the pro, uh, Proterozoic and the Archean uh, period, you then have all of these other million years of evolution. So starting at about um, uh, 550 or so million years ago, you have the Cambrian explosion, and that's where you first get really complex multicellular life as we know it. The Cambrian explosion is the kickoff point that starts the massive diversification of life on Earth. So think about that. Life's been around for 3.7 billion years. We don't start seeing wide-scale proliferation of complex animal and organic life until, you know, 540 million years ago. That's a huge, you know, length of time. Uh, it's, it, it is a massive amount of time where we just have a big gap there where it seems like there's a lot of bacteria doing stuff, but animals hadn't shown up yet. I mean, plants hadn't shown up yet. Um, all of those complex things, they just, they weren't around. We don't have any fossil record of them. So what does that mean? Well, it means that for the majority of time on Earth, we have not had the biodiversity that we have. But then once that biodiversity starts, once you start getting diverse, different life forms like that, it just takes off like a shot. And you go and you just start getting this massive radiation of all of these different types of life forms. And it's really a fascinating study. Um, this is paleontology, and I could spend hours talking about paleontology. Unfortunately, that's not what this video is about. So this is just a brief snapshot of deep time, all right? And we will come back to this, and we'll talk about this some more when we do a little more on geology. We will talk about this history of life on Earth. But this, um, these, these images that I have to my side here, this is just kind of a quick snapshot of our fossil record. So as I was saying, um, life originated about 3.6 to 3.8 billion years ago. I say 3.7 um, because it kind of splits that difference there. There's some argument as to when the exact date is. And when you're talking about billions of years like that, uh, it's kind of close enough, you know? More than 3 billion years passed, though, before complex multicellular life arose. And in that time, you have aerobic and anaerobic bacteria becoming the dominant life on Earth, like I said. All complex life on Earth um, that we think of as plants and animals and fungi have really only existed for the past, you know, 650 million years. Um, and then this right here is where you get this radiation and adaptation of life on Earth. Um, this is where you get the Cambrian explosion. And I'm going to link to a video uh, for the channel PBS Eons. Um, they have an excellent video that talks about the Great Oxygen Catastrophe, um, which is what happens in this time frame prior to the diversification of life, where you've got a huge number of uh, bacteria just trying out different things, basically just figuring out how to perform simple functions like cellular respiration, photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, those kind of things. All right. So what is this fossil record that I keep talking about? Well, the fossil record is the history of life on Earth that comes from fossils. Fossils are formed by a process of deposition when organisms or animals die, parts of them or anything like that become trapped and replaced with minerals, okay? You've probably seen fossils before, you've probably heard of fossils before. 
The thing is, this can include bones, teeth, seeds, sometimes even just impressions of the things. Yeah, you can have impression fossils. Those are known as trace fossils. And in fact, the picture that's directly above me is a picture that I took of some trace fossils that I found when I was hiking in uh, Colorado. It looks like those might be um, either worms or some other uh, tracks laid down probably by some kind of invertebrate. Um, I can't be certain because I don't know the dates of the rocks there, but um, those patterns are patterns that I've seen before in living things where you have worms that move through sediment under oceans. And where I was was part of the Western Interior Seaway. It was underwater when basically Tyrannosaurus was around, okay? So, um, what we have though as our record of life on Earth is the fossil record, but unfortunately it's an incomplete record because things that with a low water content and hard objects fossilize best. Things like bones, things like exoskeletons. What does not fossilize well are squishy things. So most of the life on Earth are invertebrates or are squishy and they may not fossilize well. So we only have a record of probably about 1% of all life that has ever existed on Earth. And we just don't have a complete picture of the fossil record. Now, we do have enough parts of it that we can piece it together, but we don't know every single organism that has ever existed because there's no guarantee that they're going to fossilize. And from this record, we can get a history of life on Earth. Um, everything from trilobites, which are uh, what you have um, all the way over and up at the top, um, to Anomalocaris, which ate them, to the uh, cynodonts, that's Dimetrodon, that is over there. Um, and then next to that, between uh, that and the skulls that you see, though that's Archaeopteryx, which is known as the first bird. That's kind of quotation marks, it's a dinosaur with feathers. And then you have a series of different bear skulls that all existed within the past 10,000 years. That's just 10,000 years right there. Um, so this is kind of our record of life on Earth as you move through these uh, these different stages. But even there, we don't have everything. All right, so then let's talk about evolution. We can look at the fossil record and we can see uh, a progression of different changes, um, adaptations, and how uh, animals have solved problems throughout time. So the process that we have to talk about, if we're gonna talk about evolution, first of all, is natural selection, all right? So you may have heard this term natural selection before, and it was a term that was kind of coined by Charles Darwin. The basic idea here is that um, you have mutations in DNA that occur naturally and randomly. Mutations happen all the time. You probably have a few mutations in your DNA. Some mutations are beneficial, some are not. On rare occasions though, a mutation may give a small advantage to a individual. So if you look above me, what you'll see is the different tortoises on different Galapagos Islands. So look up there and you can see the Hood Island tortoise. Um, you can see that it's got what's called a saddleback shell. And what that means is that the front of its shell curves upward, okay? So it's got this big scoop upward and it's got this long neck. Now, the island that the Hood Island tortoise lives on, or Hood Island in other words, it has, very, very little vegetative ground cover in terms of like grasses and clover and stuff like that. Instead, most of the plants have their leaves up above the ground. You've got a lot of shrubs and cactus. So that tortoise having that long neck can reach its neck up and chomp, 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 uh, eat those uh, bushes and shrubs and cactus and stuff like that. So it needs to have that long neck to reach up and do that. Well, those bushes and shrubs are more drought resistant and Hood Island has regular droughts. So as a result, nature has selected for it. In other words, an advantage was conferred for that Hood Island tortoise to have that. Natural selection and evolution, they're not guided by a goal. It's not like, you know, the tortoise got there and said, oh man, there's a whole bunch of shrubs here. I guess I better evolve a long neck and like got to work on that. No, what you have is this concept of survival of the fittest. Instead, it's the other way. The environment picked the tortoises that will survive there, okay? 
survival of the fittest means reproductive fittest. It's not necessarily the strongest. That doesn't mean the Hood Island tortoise is stronger than the Isabel Island tortoise, which has a dome-shaped shell and it's got a real short neck. No, it just means that on Isabel Island, there's a lot of ground uh, vegetation, like grasses and stuff like that, that the dome-shaped shell works well for. Having a big rounded shell and um, having a short neck is fine there because they can just graze across the ground. The extra energy needed to grow a longer neck or things like that didn't confer, uh, confer any kind of advantage, and it didn't help it out. Um, on Pinta Island, you've got a regular cycle of you know grasses coming in in the spring and then woody plants in the fall, so the tortoise there kind of splits the difference, and it has a little bit of both because it didn't heavily select one way or another. This survival of the fittest that you see above me, what that means is that instead of it individual, it being individual strength, where you know the Hood Island tortoise is a strong source, no, it just means that that individual has the most likely chance of having the most descendants. It is a largely random process that is then selecting by nature for a series of traits that benefit it in that specific situation. Now, if you took that Hood Island tortoise and you dropped it into the middle of the rainforest, it wouldn't do well because that's not the environment that it has the benefit of. This does not mean that the Hood Island tortoise is weak. It does not mean that the Hood Island tortoise is strong. It means that the Hood Island tortoise is most fit to survive on Hood Island. And this is a very specific example that we can draw because we have this collection of islands with slightly different characteristics and therefore we get organisms with slightly different traits. So adaptation is the process by which organisms gain slight advantages in their environment. And by adapting, it allows them to fill in to different niches. So, so Species will evolve and change to ensure the survival of their genome, and that means taking advantage of a niche. If you recall, a niche is a specific place in an ecosystem where an organism fits. Basically, it's job in the ecosystem. Um, it is the spot that it occupies. It de defines kind of what it eats, what eats it, where, what physical lo location does it occupy, and what resources can it use pretty much the, the the narrowing down of what role and what activities that organism does in its home ecosystem. Um, specialized species, um, I've talked about these a little bit, but I'm going to refine it and talk about it a little bit more. They evolved to occupy a narrow niche, okay? So koalas. Koalas are a great example of a narrow niche because they can only eat eucalyptus. And right now, the koala is in a lot of trouble because a huge amount of Australia's eucalyptus forests have burned to the ground. You may recall in the spring, most of Australia was completely on fire. And that has led to the functional wild extinction of, of, of koalas. Now 98% of all koalas that exist in the world live in some kind of facility, a zoo, an animal sanctuary. Um, heck, some of these guys are basically living in converted humane society shelters because those koalas have almost completely lost their habitat. So does this mean the koala is extinct? I don't know yet, but the koala is not in a good shape because you can't just pick up a koala, drop them off here in Arizona and say, go for it koala, because they can't survive on the food that we have here. They can't eat anything except that eucalyptus. That's a problem for the koala. Another example, hey, this guy right here, that's the black-footed ferret, it's a cute little fella. Black-footed ferret can only eat prairie dogs. If you get rid of the prairie dogs, you get rid of the black-footed ferret, and that's exactly what happened in Montana. They lived in a narrow region in Montana where you had prairie dogs, and prairie dogs dig burrows underground. Well, ranchers killed off all the prairie dogs because Horses and cattle were tripping in these um, in these uh, burrows, these prairie dog burrows, and breaking their legs. So that meant a loss of profit for the ranchers. So about 100 years ago, they went out and killed off all the prairie dogs. And the number of black-footed ferrets declined so much that they were listed as extinct. They were listed as extinct from like 1950 to 1978 or 79. Then one of them was found. 
And everybody went, oh my God, where, where did this thing come from? And they did, had this whole research project to try and find them. And they found about a dozen individuals and they realized what had happened with those prairie dogs and everything like that. And they rewilded prairie dogs and they've been breeding black-footed ferrets in captivity. So the black-footed ferrets are coming back from the brink of extinction. But now you get the problem of wildfire and those prairie dogs are now getting sick with a number of different diseases, including bubonic plague, um, typhus, um, some uh, a, a version of SARS, similar to COVID-19, that they've been getting for the past couple of years. Well, now we're working really hard to make sure that those prairie dogs stay alive so the black-footed ferret doesn't go completely extinct. On the other side, you've got things that will occupy a huge range. So those are generalists, and they will uh, take up a broad range of niches. So above me, you've got the coyote. Coyotes have flourished. Wolf populations have gone down and coyote populations have exploded. It's now estimated that there are more coyotes living in the United States now than there were prior to 1492, basically before Europeans discovered, you know, the new world. All right. Before Europeans arrived on North America, uh, coyote populations were, were lower than they are now. Now coyote populations are bigger than they've ever been before because coyotes can eat dang near anything and they're not afraid of people. So they'll come right into neighborhoods and eat your cat. Yeah, coyotes prey on house pets. Keep your cats inside. Don't have an indoor outdoor cat. Indoor outdoor cats kill more native animals than any other invasive species. Hey, how about this guy? He's one of my favorites. I love these guys. I've seen them in the wild. They're really cool. They're blue sharks. Nobody gets mad at blue sharks. They're not too big. They're about six to eight feet long. They prey mostly on fish. They travel from, you know, deeper in the water column up to the surface every day. And they live in literally every ocean. And I'm not kidding when I say every ocean. They have been found as far as the Arctic, as far south as the Antarctic. They've been found in the Indian, Atlantic, Pacific, Philippines, everywhere. These guys are everywhere. And we're not sure if like they're all ranging around and things like that. They've got a good degree of genetic diversity, but they all appear pretty similar. So they may migrate and follow schools of fish. They may prey on different things depending on where they are. But yeah, they live basically everywhere. They're extremely adaptable. They can tolerate cold water and warm water alike. Um, they can tolerate estuarine environments, although they don't swim super far upstream, um, but they will hang out in the mouths of rivers, in lagoons, all kinds of places. The blue shark is one of the most numerous sharks on the planet, and uh, luckily they're doing relatively okay by comparison to most other sharks because they are generalists. They will eat anything and they will live anywhere. All right. So I keep talking about these different species. So Mr. Davis, what is a species? Okay, so Ernst Meyer defined a species as a group of interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from such uh, from other such groups. Basically, it is the smallest level of definition when you talk about taxonomy. And above me, you see those taxonomic groups. You have domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Do you need to know that for AP environmental science? No, no, you don't. What you basically need to understand is that the species is that bottommost level. You, your species is Homo sapien sapien. However, you are not the only Homo sapien because you have Homo sapien uh, neanderthalus and Homo sapien uh, destivonian and things like that. So we have subspecies, all right? Your dog, that's Canis lupus familiaris. The gray wolf is Canis lupus lupus. <gasps> Ooh, that's speciation. Those are distinct things. But here's the question. Can you breed a dog with a wolf? Yes, you can. So here's where we get some problems. Uh, what about hybridization? This right here, this guy is a pizzly bear. Yeah, that's the actual name for them. They're called pizzly bears. Uh, grizzly bears are able to range farther north than they usually can because, because the climate is warming. So warmer summers and uh, warmer winters are allowing the grizzly bear in Alaska to move farther north. Uh, then you have the polar bears. Polar bears are now losing out on their foodstuffs because the ice caps are melting. So they don't have anywhere they can roam around. They can't catch seals easily. So now they're scavenging along beaches and catching fish and things like that where grizzly bears are. You get interaction and eventually, hey, they start to look at each other and you know, they bond over, uh, I don't know, a whale carcass that's washed up on the beach. And then little baby pizzly bears are born. Yeah, that's a pizzly bear. Now, here's the thing. Pizzly bears are not all white like polar bears, but grizzly bears are not afraid of people or urban environments and they will tolerate traveling farther south and warmer weather. Polar bears 
they don't like big urban environments, but they will actively hunt people. Yeah, polar bears will hunt people because they don't care. They'll eat anything. Problem that we have now, the pizzly bear. The pizzly bear is not afraid of urban environments and will actively hunt people. This is what we did with climate change. Fun times. But this is a problem with saying that this is a species. It can only be this is that those species definitions are fluid. They change as the environment changes. So new species sometimes arise because of, well, hybridization, all right? You also have, what is the nature of isolation? I was like, well, what if you have one species that suddenly gets stuck on an island? Is it now you know, two different species when you had one before? Um, you've got bacteria that practice horizontal gene transfer, which is a whole other thing. And then you got non-sexually reproductive species. Can they be still considered species because they're not interbreeding with each other? Well, we're gonna talk about some of those things. And this is how we get into island biogeography. So let me show you how this then relates. The concept of speciation. Under certain circumstances, natural selection and niche availability will lead to something called speciation. And this is the diversification of different species from an ancestor. Speciation is where two or more species arrive from a single one due to two populations no longer breeding with each other. And this can happen when one population gets isolated from another, when you get hybridization, and so a great example of this is if you look above me, those are what are called Darwin's finches. They're the finches of the Galapagos Island. If you look at their beaks, you can see that they all have these very different shaped beaks. And this is based off of what they eat. They filled out all of these different niches on the Galapagos Islands based on what food or prey was available. Okay? So... This is also known as divergent evolution or evolutionary divergence. Basically, they spread out, they radiated and adapted to all these different plants or uh, to eat all these different plants and things like that. You also get hybridization playing a role here. So an example of a case study that I want to show you guys. If you look over here, what you'll see is information about the Espanola cactus finch. All right. It was able to crossbreed under a unique set of circumstances with the medium cactus finch, all right? And it produced a new species with a distinct bill beak, their, their mouth parts, distinct beak size, shape, and they have a unique song. Remember, birds sing to talk to other birds, basically to, to call and attract a mate. Well, this was around the year 2000. Um, they proliferated and you had about 17 individuals after the first year, but then in about 2002 to 2003, all but two individuals of the species died. When the rains returned, though, you all of a sudden had these uh, finches that had a larger beak and had a wider range of things that they could eat. Because remember, they're a cross between the Espanola cactus finch and the medium cactus finch. So they were able to eat the same things that the medium finch ate and the Espanola cactus finch ate. So they ate multiple things. They became more generalist. So since 2003, they've proliferated. Their numbers are up to about, um, at last count, I saw about uh, 200 individuals. So this is a new species that evolved literally while scientists were watching it. This is fascinating. This is an amazing thing. They are now classified as their own unique species. Now here's the question, should they be protected? Do we need to you know, take care of them? Are they endangered? They're brand new, all right? But what we'll find out is, does this species have better genes? I mean, is it more fit for its environment? Are we going to get a continuation of this species? Because this right here is the foundation of evolution. And this ties all in very nicely with this theory of island biogeography. So here it is. Here's the theory that I've been teasing this whole video, all right? The thing is, because resources are limited everywhere, but more so on islands, species will evolve to be specialists as a result, usually. Individuals compete for resources, so they will fill in and exploit any available niche, all right? The highest species richness will generally be found on a large island near the mainland, and that's explained by these diagrams over here. And I know they look a little confusing, okay? But what I want you to realize is that what you will get is when you have a large island near the mainland, 
you will get a number of organisms that are able to come in from the mainland. So you have a high degree of immigration, okay? Large island means that it's going to have uh, more niches available. And what you're going to get is a greater number of species as a result. And that's what those things uh, are all showing you. Now, I'm going to go into this in much more detail. I just want to introduce the basic concept here. But the key thing that you want to learn from this video is that um, when you have speciation occurring, large islands near the mainland will have a greater degree of that speciation. You'll have more species evolving. You'll get a lower species richness, so a lower uh, biodiversity in that respect, when you have small islands that are far from the mainland. So you only get like one or two things arriving, and then you know they will fill out those niches and create a point of equilibrium. All right, okay, so let's review real quick, all right? So first and foremost, evolution is the process by which species and organisms change over time, okay? Um, adaptations are traits that organisms have that may make them slightly more fit to their environment. Um, all adaptation and evolution begins with a chance mutation that may confer some slightly better fitness, which means it has a better chance of reproducing and passing on its, its genes. All right? Speciation occurs when you have competition for limited resources, so organisms will diversify and spread out to fill in those individual niches. And as a result of speciation, when you have a highly limited environment like an island, what you will get is a greater degree of specialization. Specialists being organisms that prey on or eat only specific things or live in only very specific habitats. And they do this so that they can focus on their little niche and they have as little competition for that as possible. All right. All right, guys, that's where I'm going to end this one. If you have any questions, of course, let me know. Otherwise, I want you guys to take care. You have a great day and I'll see you soon. Bye, guys.